Hey there, my friends. Welcome to The Unfolding Restoration with me. I'm Anthony Sweat. I'm grateful to get to host and teach about these important concepts that laid the foundation of the restoration. Today's video is a little sadder and somber of tone because we're going to look at the martyrdom of the prophet Joseph Smith. And as we talk about the martyrdom, what I hope to accomplish in this video with, you've likely heard lessons and classes and things about the martyrdom uh, when Joseph Smith was killed and his brother Hiram on June 27th, 1844. You've heard these your whole life or your whole time you've been a member of the church. What I have found is that most people don't actually know what led up to the martyrdom, the events that surrounded it and, and caused it, and also they're not quite uh, as familiar with the impacts of the martyrdom on the church. So what I want to talk about in this video is what are the events that build up to it? What led to Joseph's death? And I want to explore the idea too of did Joseph Smith have to die? Uh, was that something that the Lord uh, foreordained and, and seemed to have in his mind to happen? And in the next video, we'll get into some of the consequences of the martyrdom, including how it affected the church and the succession question of who should lead the church. I want to kick off with this question that I have asked. Did Joseph Smith have to be martyred? Just think about that. How would the church be different? How would the restoration be different had Joseph Smith not been martyred? Had Joseph Smith lived a long, full life into his 80s, uh, like some of our modern prophets today, grown old with a white beard and, and eventually passed on through some, um, you know, natural causes? Would the restoration have been different? I think so. One verse I want to start off with you is in Doctrine and Covenants section 136, verse 37 through 39. This is the only revelation that we have canonized that came to President Brigham Young when he was leading the church as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles after Joseph's death. The Lord told Brigham Young that Joseph was sent, quote, to bring forth my work, which foundation he did lay and was faithful, and I took him to myself. Many have marveled because of his death but it was needful that he should seal his testimony with his blood, that he might be honored and the wicked might be condemned. That line, it was needful from the Lord himself that he should seal his testimony with his blood. There's something to Joseph giving his life through death that is different from him dying of natural old age that acted as uh, a fire or a spark in the flame of the restoration to keep it burning and keep it alive uh, in the hearts of many and continues in many today. One of the things I want you to understand is when I say that Joseph gave his life, I also do believe that Joseph gave his life. I do think he might have been able to escape west. He was on his way west, as we'll talk about, and that he voluntarily went back and submitted to the charges in Carthage knowing that it would lead to his eventual uh, death. Brigham Young taught this about Joseph Smith's death. It was always a strange thing to me that Joseph Smith should have to lay down his life. Until I found the following passage of Scripture, it is contained in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, 16 and 17 verses. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And so when Joseph fell by the old well curb at Carthage jail, pierced by the bullets of assassins, he placed the capstone upon his mission by sealing it with his blood. And from that time henceforth, it is in force on all the world. It is a powerful idea that people are willing to die for a cause to motivate and validate that very cause. Well, also what I want you to see in this video is that there's a pattern in Joseph's death. I mentioned that he voluntarily gave his life, just to me in a similar way, a much less way, and I want to be careful of this. Joseph is a man, even though he's a prophet, and Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus' death was to ransom and reconcile and justify and atone for all of mankind, infinite atonement, and to give us salvation and exaltation. There's a difference there, but Joseph's death was also seemed to be foreordained and had a purpose. And uh, there's a pattern, there's a general pattern between prophets and the master that they follow. There's a pattern even in Joseph Smith's death, former BYU Dean of Religion, 
And my emeritus colleague in the religion department, Robert Millet, wrote this, quote, the life of Joseph Smith was in some degree patterned after that of his master, Jesus Christ. That pattern holds true even when extended to its tragic conclusion. Like his master, Joseph Smith also shed his blood in order that the final testament, the reestablishment of the new covenant, might be in full effect. In Joseph's death, it's interesting to kind of look at, there are a few parallels uh, between maybe charges that were brought, false accusations, traitors. It's interesting in this to ask yourself, who might Judas Iscariot be? Who is Peter? What's the trial? Who is Pontius Pilate in the death of Joseph Smith for making parallels? And I want to give you one that's, that's interesting up front. Uh, and Pontius Pilate, this person identifies himself, maybe not uh, directly, but, uh, uh, but sees the, the connection himself. This is Governor Thomas Ford, who was the governor of Illinois, and who was one of the people that when you read section 135 of the Doctrine and Covenants, it really condemns Thomas Ford, which is uh, sad and, and, and ironic also because early on Thomas Ford, we have songs, jubilees, cheering Thomas Ford when, when Joseph Smith, for example, when the Missourians tried to extradite him and Thomas Ford helped Joseph Smith be cleared of all his charges, we actually sang a jubilee song to Thomas Ford, and Thomas Ford seemed to have uh, some virtues, but he seemed to have some vices also as a politician, strengths and weaknesses, and uh, one of his major weaknesses was, he, I, I do believe, that he allowed Joseph Smith to be killed, and I'll share with you why in a second, why, why I say that, but back to this like link where he himself sees some connections. In section 135, announcing Joseph's death, it says, the broken pledges of the governor and state of Illinois that I'll talk about in a minute. When Praise to the Man was originally written, uh, it, it didn't say, long shall his blood, which was shed by assassins, plead unto heaven while the earth lauds his fame. The original words were, long shall his blood, which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame. Church later changed those lyrics uh, to not offend all of you. Who are watching this from Illinois or maybe from Illinois, uh, it's probably good that that was changed. But there, there was hard feelings towards Governor Ford in the state of Illinois because of Joseph's death. Well, why? Well, look what Thomas Ford writes in uh, 1854, a decade after Joseph's death, and he says, he feared that in one day in the future someone will make the name of the martyred Joseph ring as loud and stir the souls of men as much as the mighty name of Christ himself. Little did he know that people like me would be on these videos and uh, going worldwide and, and doing exactly what he said, that people will proclaim the name of Joseph as a prophet. And then look at this, he's kind of talking, in my opinion, or writing a little uh, tongue-in-cheek or a little mockingly. He says, Sharon, Palmyra, Manchester, Kirtland, Far West, Adam on Diamond, Ramus, Nauvoo, and the Carthage Jail may become holy and venerable places, places of classic interest in another age, like Jerusalem, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, and Mount of Calvary to the Christian, and Mecca and Medina to the Turk. Now, what's interesting is, I think he's writing this mocking because these places are in the middle of nowhere and the Latter-day Saints are a poor minority religion who had been kicked out west. But probably you watching this video, how many of you have been to Far West or Nauvoo or Carthage Jail or, and uh, traveled there, made pilgrimage to these holy places I've never seen a better prophecy than from Governor Ford there. Then look at he writes, and in that event, the author of this history feels degraded by the reflection that the humble governor of an obscure state, who would otherwise be forgotten in a few years, stands a fair chance like Pilate and Herod by their official connection with the true religion of being dragged down to posterity with an immoral name. Thomas Ford links himself as the Pontius Pilate in the story. Uh, which is fascinating. And one of the reasons why Governor Ford, and I'm, I might touch on this, but since I'm talking about him right now, um, I'll, I'll just mention it. One of the reasons why Governor Ford is condemned so much in the martyrdom of Joseph Smith is because Governor Ford had the power to protect him, and he pledged to protect him when Joseph submitted to the charges in Carthage jail. But Governor Ford allowed the mob to attack Carthage jail. Now, that might be a misread uh, on my part, but I think there's some historical evidence to support it. 
One of the ones is that in 1854, the same year that Governor Ford wrote his history, John Taylor, who was one of the four people in the room with Joseph when he's killed, Joseph and Hiram are murdered and killed. John Taylor and Willard Richards are two apostles, the only other two in the room who survive to act as a witness of what went on. John Taylor, in 1854, 10 years later, also writes a recollection or gives an account of the martyrdom. John Taylor's 1854 account, he talks about the whole thing and everything that led up to it. And I'll talk about what he says led up to the martyrdom. He says something interesting. When they submitted the charges at Carthage, John Taylor went and met with Governor Ford. And he said to, the, to Governor Ford that a mob was going to form and going to kill Joseph. And Joseph said this to Governor Ford. And, and Governor Ford said, oh, the men aren't that cruel. They wouldn't do such a thing. But one of the things that's interesting that he says to John Taylor is Governor Ford says to John Taylor, you guys should have never had the city council vote to destroy the Nauvoo Expositor, the printing press that I'll talk about as I take you through a narrative history of what led up to it. And John Taylor talks about how, uh, why their decision was made. And then Governor Ford says something interesting. Not that the press shouldn't have been stopped. Governor Ford said, quote, I would have got up a mob to destroy it and that would have cleared the city council. Or in other words, as city leaders, you wouldn't have been liable, Joseph as mayor and some of these other city councilmen. Now, Governor Ford didn't realize it, but he may have been showing how he operates. He's like, if you guys had a nuisance and you didn't want to deal with it officially on a state level, then you just turn a blind eye and you let a mob take care of it, and then you're not held liable. That sounds very familiar to exactly what uh, Thomas Ford will do to Joseph Smith on June 27th, 1844, knowing that he has a nuisance and a problem in Joseph and the Latter-day Saints and a mob that wants to kill him, and Governor Ford is going to turn a blind eye and let the death happen. Well, what led up to this, and what are some of the factors that contributed to it? Since I mentioned John Taylor's 1854 account, John Taylor lists five things that really led up to the martyrdom and really contributed to the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. If I said to you, what caused it? What, what brought it about? Uh, sometimes our basic answer of, well, people just didn't like Joseph because he was a prophet or they felt like uh, you know, they were against the church. That's a part of it, but it's not everything. John Taylor, in his own recollection, lists five things. The first one he lists is plural marriage. He says, quote, a new doctrine of men having more than one wife is called polygamy. We have to recognize that plural marriage was uh, directly involved in the death of Joseph Smith. That's why in the last video that I did for this series, in video 22, Joseph says, hey, I'm going to implement this practice even if it costs me my life. Joseph knew that the, the, the revulsion that would come against a practice of plural marriage that could lead to his death and did. It led to some of the men being vehemently against Joseph. The second one was apostate dissension, in particular people like John C. Bennett, uh, the Laws, the Fosters, and the Higbees that I'll talk about. And in particular, the destruction of their newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor that I'll tell you about. The third one would be kind of religious suspicion, religious hostility. John Taylor says, quote, our religion was not a popular religion. It was opposed to their religions, meaning our doctrines disagreed. The fourth, though, that you can't overlook either is John Taylor mentions political power. Joseph Smith was very involved in politics. He was the mayor. At this time, he was running for president of the United States of America, and the church held a lot of political power as we continued to gather people in the county, in the area, uh, and in the state. Um, and the church did not hesitate to use their political influence uh, to get what they wanted. John Taylor just remembers, quote, we possess the power of the votes in that county, is what John Taylor says. And then the fifth one was, he just says, there were some wicked people in the area. He calls them, quote, a set of rabble, pickpockets, cutthroats, blacklegs, who could be hired to kill a man for a small sum and perjure himself any day for a glass of grog. In other words, there was just a handful of wicked people in the area on, in the, um, uh, that, would, that would say, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll join with you and try to kill Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Those five things seem to contribute into the martyrdom of Joseph. So let me take you through kind of a narrative history of what leads up to the martyrdom, so you can see these five things coming into play. I'm going to use a lot of things from the book Saints. A lot of this narrative history is coming from Saints. 
also coming from uh, a book by Ryan Jenkins called The Assassination of Joseph Smith that gives a good timeline history on the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. I'm going to back all the way up to May of 1842, two years before the martyrdom of Joseph. There's, I mentioned three sets of brothers, the Laws, the Fosters, and the Higbees. And uh, my colleague Andrew Hedges has won- published some wonderful articles on the difficulties uh, between them that I'm drawing on as well. But in May of 1842, Chauncey Higby is cut off from the church because of immorality, and he confesses to unchaste and unvirtuous conduct towards certain females. He seems to have fallen into some of the spiritual wifery teachings being promoted by John C. Bennett uh, that had led to illicit sexual relations with, between men and women in Nauvoo. In June of 1842, Chauncey's brother Francis, which is sad because Chauncey and Francis are the sons of Elias Higby, Joseph's good friend. Uh, Francis Higby, also influenced by John C. Bennett, uh, also has seduced about a half a dozen women, uh, and he's found guilty of adultery and upset that he's been exposed. In this, that same summer of 1842, I mentioned John C. Bennett. Uh, John C. Bennett, uh, somebody summarized him once as he has brains, he has ability, but he has no soul. And what's sad is that John C. Bennett was one of the people who came into Nauvoo uh, when there was kind of a power vacuum because of the apostasy of David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery and others. John C. Bennett came in as an adept politician, someone who was experienced, someone who was capable, someone with a lot of talent. He helped the church get their Nauvoo charter, their city charter. He helped them be protected. He helped Joseph in some political things. He helped uh, financially. He was a a doctor, a, a lawyer, he was capable in all these areas, <clears throat> and he proposed and presented himself as a single man who was a bachelor. Joseph quickly takes him into his confidence, makes him an advisor, or even some could call him a counselor, to the first presidency. John C. Bennett becomes the mayor of Nauvoo, he becomes uh, the president of their future not, uh, university, he also becomes the general of the Nauvoo Legion, he becomes a very prominent person. But he's also an immoral person, and uh, he ends up taking some of Joseph's uh, teachings that he's likely heard about plural marriage and using them to seduce different women to have uh, relations with him. So because of that, John C. Bennett will be excommunicated from the church and cut off and publicly exposed, and he quickly tries to turn the tables. I mean, if, if John C. Bennett is about position and power, the moment he's cut off from the church, he's going to go try to get prominence and position of power by going against the church. He writes a bunch of letters to the Sangamo Journal talking about Joseph Smith's practice of spiritual wifery and uh, blames, for example, that Missouri Governor Boggs, who somebody who had, had attempted to assassinate him in Missouri while Joseph was in Illinois, he tries to pin that on Joseph and leads to Joseph trying to be extradited. And, uh, Governor, what I'm trying to show is in the summer of 42, John C. Bennett, and his excommunication is going to cause a lot of problems, and it's going to begin tipping the public tide of opinion against the church in Nauvoo and against Joseph Smith in a lot of ways. In January of 1843, we get a new governor. Uh, His name is Thomas Ford. I've already mentioned him. Uh, Governor Ford takes over for Governor Carlin, and Governor Carlin, in essence, says to Governor Ford, you've got to keep your eye on Joseph Smith uh, and the Mormons. He's unwieldy. Uh, Thomas Ford actually meets with Joseph, and is, uh, and, and they talk, but he's a little suspicious and tells Joseph to refrain from all political electioneering. By the way, Joseph Smith will, uh, he, he's like, don't, don't mix uh, religion and politics, and maybe he was wise in saying that, but Joseph won't listen to him, and uh, by 1844, Joseph will be running for president of the United States of America, as I mentioned. In July of 1843, Joseph writes down the revelation on plural marriage, as I've mentioned in a previous video. Uh, You can watch video uh, 22, the one preceding this, to learn more about that. Um, A number of people react negatively to it um, and fear that uh, it will ruin us as a people. There's also a man who comes along the scene. His name's Thomas Sharp. Now, Thomas Sharp is a young editor of this uh, newspaper called the Warsaw Signal in the neighboring town of Warsaw. Illinois. Originally, Thomas Sharp was very favorable to the Latter-day Saints. When we show up and we lay the cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple, Thomas Sharp is there and writes glowing reviews about Joseph and the church. 
but he quickly begins to sour against the church, particularly when he sees how much political influence the church has in the area. And I don't think it helps that he loses in some political um, races against Latter-day Saints as well. He starts to write uh, very uh, vehemently and uh, critically of the church in Nauvoo. And in September of 1843, uh, Joseph, when, he's, when Thomas Sharp is using inflammatory political rhetoric against the church, Joseph writes to Thomas Sharp and resigns his subscription. And, and instead of signing it like your servant Joseph Smith, he signs it, yours with utter contempt, Joseph Smith. Uh, not a good relationship between uh, Thomas Sharp and Joseph Smith. And Thomas Sharp will continue to criticize the church moving forward at that time. In the fall of 1843, William Law, who is Joseph's first counselor in the first presidency, begins to have some problems. Um, he does not, uh, William Law loves Joseph and part of the first presidency, second counselor in the first presidency, sustains and supports him, but when he starts to hear about plural marriage, um, he reacts very negatively towards it and feels that it's wrong. Uh, interestingly, there are some records that show that uh, William Law himself has had an adulterous relationship um, that he confessed to Hiram Smith. Joseph refuses to seal William Law uh, to his wife Jane. So you're starting to see some difficulties between William Law and uh, Joseph Smith as a whole. In December of 1843, Joseph starts to say in certain councils that we have a Judas in our midst, uh, that we have somebody who's going to betray me. And uh, William Law and also the Nauvoo Stake President William Marks take offense to that, thinking that Joseph is suggesting that it's them. In January of 1844, uh, as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, the people who had received their temple endowment or temple ceremonies were sometimes called the anointed quorum. And in January of 1844, William Law and William Marks are suspiciously not present, the second counselor in the first presidency and also the Nauvoo stake president, um, showing that they're distancing themselves from Joseph and the leading quorums. And in January of 1844, William Law starts to openly turn against Joseph Smith. He tries to persuade William Marks that Joseph is a fallen prophet. He seems to also be uh, talking to Emma, maybe about plural marriage or things that Emma doesn't know, uh, creating some problems uh, in the Smith family. Joseph reportedly says that, quote, all the sorrow I ever had in my family has arisen through the influence of William Law. In January of 1844, Joseph Smith will drop William Law from the first presidency of the church. Also in January 44, Joseph starts to write, and the church starts writing letters to various candidates who are running for president, ask president of the U.S., asking if they will give them better support than previous presidents have done. They don't receive any favorable responses uh, from any of the current candidates. And so, in that month of January 44, in a meeting with Hiram Smith and the Twelve, Joseph says that the two primary candidates of Martin Van Buren and Henry Clay they won't use their federal power to help the saints. It was really easy, and at this time in America, politically, it was very state-heavy, and the federal government had lim more limited power than they do today. And most of the federal government, the president himself would say, hey, that's a state's issue if you're being persecuted. And Joseph's like, the problem is with the state. It's the governor, like of Missouri, Governor Boggs, who signed an extermination order. What do we do then? And so, because they won't use their federal powers, Joseph says that he can't in good conscience support either of the candidates for President of the United States of America. Willard Richards in this meeting proposes that we have our own candidate then, that a Latter-day Saint runs for it, and they say, well, who do we want? The council votes, and they all unanimously say, we want Joseph Smith to run for president. And uh, since the council voted for it, and Joseph loves to hearken and, and lean on the voice of United Councils, Joseph throws his whole heart and soul into it and selects uh, Sidney Rigdon to be his running mate um, uh, as vice president, puts together a political platform with the help of many. Joseph's platform is uh, great. He wants to give more, uh, listen to where these are coming from, he wants to give more federal power to put down mobs, to free the slaves. He actually has an ingenious idea of let America expand westward take the lands that the government has, compensate slaveholders, that way they're compensated, but, but the uh, slaves are freed. 
He wants to open the U.S. all the way out to Oregon, wants to form a national bank, and he wants to reform the prison system. Joseph has experience with all these things, banking, prison, uh, federal power, uh, etc., which inform his political platform, which history has shown that uh, America went a lot of the ways that, uh, that Joseph uh, put forward in his platform. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more about Joseph Smith's run for president of the United States, read Derek Sainsbury's book on Joseph Smith and the political missionaries who went out and served him. Joseph calls 500 people on missions to go out and campaign for him as president of the United States and also to preach the gospel. Uh, there's a great Why Religion podcast episode called Joseph Smith for President where you can learn more and listen to him on that. In February of 1844, Francis Higby and his brother Chauncey get together and join William and Wilson Law and also uh, Robert and Charles Foster. There are two sets of brothers that have had some business dealings with Joseph that have begun to have some fallout with him. They proactively in February start to meet and to talk and discuss, we might even use the word conspire, about how and why Joseph is a fallen prophet and how they can save the church or remove him uh, from, from what he's doing to the church. In February of 1844, the Laws and the Higbees and other dissenters in Nauvoo start to hold some private meetings on February 26th. In the succeeding days, they hold two more meetings. Uh, these are proactive private meetings in Nauvoo to talk about Joseph as a fallen prophet and how to uh, get rid of him. They decide to approach, I want to tell you this quick story that most don't know about, they, they decide to invite two teenage boys, one named Robert Scott and one named Dennis and Harris, uh, to come to the meeting. I believe they're 18 or 19 years old. Uh, at the meeting, these boys hear about what these men are saying about Joseph Smith. And after the first meeting, they go back and they tell Joseph, like, hey, these people are meeting to start to conspire to take you down. Uh, and Joseph says, will you keep attending those meetings as a spy, but promise me you won't make any oaths or make any promises to them, but uh, uh, keep an eye on them and inform me. So these boys keep attending the meetings. At the third meeting that they start to hold, uh, they, they make the people there swear an oath on the Bible, I believe it's Chauncey Higby, has all the people in the room swear an oath on the Bible that they will do all within their power to bring about the destruction of Joseph Smith. This is getting serious. Could you imagine somebody holding meetings, swearing on the Bible, the group of people that they're going to do all within their power to bring about your destruction? They try to force these two boys to take that oath. And they refuse to. They say, for all we know, Joseph Smith is a prophet and a good man. We don't know the things that you're talking about. But they keep pushing him and pushing him. They, in essence, say to the boys, you know too much. And we're not going to let you go until you swear the oath that you're with us. And the boys won't swear the oath. If you have any teenagers out there watching, ask your teenagers what, what they would do. Now ask what they would do the moment people pull out their knives and hold their knives to their throat and threaten to kill them if they don't swear the oath, which is exactly what they do to these two teenage boys. And then still they refuse to swear the oath. They march the boys down to the cellar, and they're going to kill them um, and dump their bodies in the Mississippi River until luckily some of the men, and by the way, uh, this is some of the laws in the, in, the, in the Higbees, just so you understand the type of men we're dealing with at this time, until one of the men says, hey, these boys, their fathers know that they've been with us tonight, and if they turn up missing, we'll be questioned about it. So they threaten the boys and tell them, if you say anything, we will kill you. The boys uh, leave the meeting, and the first thing they do is they run down the road and run right to Joseph Smith and tell him everything that they heard in the meeting. And it's sad, when they uh, tell Joseph, they say that Joseph just wept. They said that Joseph said, you don't know what this is going to bring about, and he just cried, uh, probably by the betrayal and probably sensing what was afoot and what was happening that would lead to his death. Uh, you can read their whole uh, account. If you just look up Robert Scott, Dennis, and Harris um, account, uh, you'll, you'll find that, that they give of that uh, time. In March of 1844, then, things get serious, and Joseph meets with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, gives them all the keys, the powers, and authority of the priesthood that he's ever received. They've received every ordinance. They've received every key. 
He's laid it on their heads. And Joseph says, they'll now have to kill all of you. Um, and they can kill me, but this kingdom will roll forward now that all this is on the heads of the twelve. And uh, Joseph says to the twelve, now round up your shoulders and stand under it like men. The Lord is going to let me rest a while. Joseph sensing that uh, things are coming to a head. Joseph, though, is still uh, defiant and angry. In March of 1844, in a public meeting, he calls out the Fosters publicly, uh, saying that there are apostates who are conspiring against him. He's learned this. Charles Foster yells back to him at this public meeting, do you mean me, Joseph? And Joseph says, you said it, and Charles Foster yells at him. And Joseph, as mayor, fines him $10 for disturbing a, a public meeting. Robert Foster then stands up and defends his brother and says, he didn't threaten you, nobody heard him threaten you, and the hundreds in attendance in the crowd say, I heard him threaten you, and Joseph tells Robert Foster to be quiet or he'll, he'll fine him too. Things are extremely tense at this time between them. In March of 1844, Joseph is also understanding that the church is not going to be able to settle and stay in Nauvoo, Illinois. He knows the church will have to go to their own place. And he has organized this thing called the Council of Fifty that I'll talk about in the next video on the succession. And he has the Council of Fifty looking at different places like Texas or like Oregon or Upper California, Mexican territory, which is modern day Utah where I'm standing right now as I uh, film this video. Uh, to help oversee where the church should go and to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. That's what the Council of Fifty is, is looking at, and that's in March of 1844. In April of 1844, Joseph Smith delivers the King Follett sermon that I've talked about in a previous uh, lesson as well at a church general conference. And you understand now in context, when he delivers that talk, you can see the events that are swirling around him. In April is when he sends out roughly these five to 600 missionaries to go on a political mission to campaign for him as President of the United States. Now, that might seem kind of cool. I don't know about you. It'd be fun to be called on a mission to go campaign for the prophet to become President of the U.S., but the problem with that is it sends out a lot of church leadership. When Joseph's going to be killed in June, most of the Quorum of the Twelve are out on missions helping to oversee uh, this political mission that Joseph has sent them out on. In April of 1844, the Fosters and Laws are officially excommunicated. Uh, from the church. So, what do they do? They immediately organize their own Reformed church, uh, and uh, William Law, they elect William Law to be their president of their Reformed church. His brother Wilson is one of his counselors, and the Fosters and Higbees are their apostles. They also propose to start a newspaper to inform all of Nauvoo and its citizens, the surrounding citizens, uh, of Joseph Smith's fallen prophetic role, and to expose him uh, and his uh, wicked practices. They decide to call the newspaper the Nauvoo Expositor as a whole. On June 7th, 1844, the first edition and only edition of the Nauvoo Expositor rolls off the press, and it lists a litany of charges against Joseph Smith. Uh, one of them is they, they are against some of his doctrines. We hope many items of doctrine is now taught, some of which, however, are taught secretly and denied openly, in other words, they're hinting at plural marriage, and others publicly, considerate men will treat with contempt. We declare them heretical and damnable in their influence, though they may find devotees. How shall he who has drank of the poisonous draft teach virtue? We are earnestly seeking to explore the vicious principles of Joseph Smith. They also, in the Nauvoo Expositor, they decried Joseph's, quote, attempt at political power and influence, and don't think it's in accordance with the Christian religion. They really don't like what he's just recently taught in the King Follett sermon, that there are many gods uh, or that we can become like God, and they call that blasphemy. Uh, they don't think that Joseph and the church should be involved in temporal or financial affairs and concerns, something that Oliver Cowdery himself, when he left the church, had issues with. Uh, they seem to have issues against uh, uh, Joseph's dealings with finances and temporal things and maybe even the law of consecration in the church. Also, they don't like any secret societies and combinations under penal oaths and obligations and call them anti-Christian. They could be referencing two things here. They either don't like the temple endowment ceremony and this quorum of the anointed that Joseph has initiated, or they're getting at in Missouri that I've talked about in a previous lesson, the Danites and Danites who punish people who oppose the, the church. And then last, their, their other one is 
They don't like that Joseph is doing this unconditional sealing up to eternal life, that he's giving people their calling and election, uh, so to speak. These are their charges of how they're exposing Joseph as a fallen prophet. And when this paper comes out, uh, Joseph's having none of it. As mayor of Nauvoo, which is what Joseph is, he decides to hold a city council meeting and ask what they should do about the newspaper. The city council deems it as a public nuisance, meaning that it could lead to threats and problems. Now, really quick, today, particularly in America, where freedom of speech and freedom of the press is sacrosanct, we have to understand also that um, when we think that Joseph wants to shut down or that the city council wants to shut down a press or a newspaper because it could lead to violence, we do that in the in the world today. We do have freedom of speech, but I cannot go onto an airplane and shout bomb um, and say freedom of speech because it will incite panic and could lead people to be hurt and I could be held liable. So my speech is limited. In the same way, they felt that this newspaper had the potential to bring about a Missouri extermination scene on Nauvoo. So they want to stop it from being published, not just to protect the reputation of Joseph Smith, but to protect the broader church. That seems to be their motive uh, in doing it. It's easy to criticize in hindsight, uh, but that seems uh, to be their understandable motive of it. Joseph's journal says this, about eight o'clock, the marshal reported that he had removed uh, the press and printed papers and fixtures into the street and fired them. This was done because of the libelous character of the paper in slandering the municipality of the city. The posse consisting of some hundred returned with the marshal in front of the mansion, and I gave them a short address and told them they had done right, that they had executed my orders required of me by the city council, that I would never submit to have another libelous publication established in the city. I care not how many papers there were in the city, if they would print the truth, but would submit to no libels or slanders from them. The speech was loudly greeted by three cheers, three times. The posse dispersed, all in good order. Then look at this note. Francis M. Higby and others made some threats, which will appear in due course of investigation. And then a very ominous line, east wind, very cold and cloudy. This will be the action that's going to lead to Joseph's arrest and his death. This is a painting that I did, a, tr a quick illustration of the scene where they took the, the, the Nauvoo Expositor and, and put the press and everything in the street and burned it, fired it, as they said, in the evening, uh, this company of roughly 100 men. If you've ever been to Nauvoo, by the way, this is on Mulholland Street, up right by the temple. The temple in this painting would be just past that latest building down towards that area. Uh, the Nauvoo Expositor is right by where there's that kind of buffet um, uh, right now, right on Main Street. Probably right on that street there is where they did that. See that green, uh, that green awning with the white door is right where the Nauvoo Expositor would have been, uh, right there. Well, the next day on June 11th, 1844, William Clayton writes that the Fosters threatened vengeance because the Fosters are part of the Nauvoo Expositor. And, and I should say, by the way, uh, if you want to read uh, uh, Dallin H. Oaks's book, The Carthage Conspiracy, it's so excellent. And with his brilliant legal mind, he looks at this case, and I may be summarizing this wrong, but in essence, uh, Elder Oaks, with his legal experience in mind, says, uh, under the law and under the circumstances, they had every right to stop the printing of the paper. Where they erred and where they overstepped was in the destruction of the property. They did not have the right to destroy someone's property, uh, which is what they did here. For, uh, back to this, William Clayton wrote that the Fosters threatened vengeance, and several of them said that the temple shall be thrown down, Joseph's house burned, and the printing office torn down, Francis M. Higby threatened hard, end of quote. On June 11th, 1844, that same day, William Law goes to Carthage, where he file, files charges against Joseph Smith on destruction of property and inciting a riot. The next day, Thomas Sharp over in Warsaw, who has just become vehemently against the church, publishes in his newspaper, war and extermination is inevitable. Citizens arise, one and all, can you stand by and suffer such infernal devils to rob men of their property and rights without avenging them? We have no time for comment. Let's not be rational about this, by the way. Let's not be civilized. Every man must make his own. Let it be made with powder and ball. Uh, he's quote, calling for the murder of Joseph Smith here. On June 13th, the next day, 
hundreds of men begin to gather into Carthage uh, to attack the saints and to kill Joseph Smith. Thomas Sharp will brag that he's responsible for bringing in 500 people uh, to kill Joseph Smith. On June 18, 1844, fearing outrage and attack on the outlying communities in Warsaw and Carthage, Joseph Smith as mayor activates the 4,000 troops of the Nauvoo Legion. We have 4,000 soldiers that we could go wreak havoc, but he activates them to defend the city, and he declares martial law in the city. Now you're Governor Ford. You're like, oh, no, we are having Missouri reenacted in, in Illinois. What do I do? He writes to Joseph, and he says, Joseph, come to Carthage and submit to the charges that are levied against you. Joseph senses there's a deeper plot that if he goes to Carthage, people are going to kill him. He, he decides he's not going to go to Carthage, and he decides to leave Nauvoo. Joseph, with Hiram and a few others, cross the Mississippi River. They're getting ready to head west to find a place for the saints to settle. I mean, Joseph is on his way. He could go west. He, he even tells Emma, like, uh, I'll, I'll send message, I'll send word, take care uh, as a whole. Uh, on next day, June 23rd, when they hear that Joseph has left, Friends and others send Joseph a letter, which is carried to him, fearing that Nauvoo, now that he's gone, is going to be attacked. And they accuse him, some accuse him, of running away in a time of need, and that they need him there. They feel like he's abandoned them. Joseph says, when he hears this, if my life is of no value to my friends, it's of no value to myself, I'm not abandoning them. He feels like he's trying to help them, and that they won't attack the city, that they only want him. So he turns to Hiram and says, Hiram, well, what should we do? And I love this, by the way. Joseph says, Hiram, you're the oldest. Uh, what should we do? And Hiram says, let's go back and submit to the charges then. Joseph says to Hiram, Hiram, if we go back, we'll be butchered. And Hiram says, Joseph, God's protected us until now. He'll protect us again. And Joseph says, not this time, uh, uh, that he was told that if he was ever taken by his enemies, that his life would not be spared anymore. Hiram turns to Joseph and says, let's go back and submit and see this thing through. I share that with you to understand that it was a, a voluntary, conscious understanding of Joseph, not only to submit to the charges, but knowing that his life would likely be taken by going back. When he gave up himself, when he came back, he stops in Nauvoo and he says to them, quote, if I do not go to Carthage, the result will be the destruction of this city and its inhabitants, and I cannot think of my dear brothers and sisters and their children suffering the scenes of Missouri again in Nauvoo. No, it's better for your brother Joseph to die for his brothers and sisters, for I am willing to die for them. My work is finished. On June 24, 1844, that same day, Joseph meets with the Nauvoo Legion to have them return their state-issued guns under the direction of Governor Ford. The Nauvoo Legion reluctantly does so, and and Joseph says when he departs, my friends, I love you too well to save my life at your expense. If I go not to them, they will come and act out the horrified Missouri scenes in Nauvoo. I may prevent it. I fear not death. On June 24th, Joseph arrives in Carthage around midnight. A mob of hundreds of militiamen are already gathered waiting for them, partly due to Thomas Sharp's call for these people to come, uh, calling the entire militia together at Carthage or Warsaw. Sharp exaggerates, saying he's got 7,000 armed men ready to attack. When they're taken into the Hamilton Hotel is where they stay that first night. The chaotic scene breaks out and someone shouts, stand away, let us shoot the Mormons. Blank, blank, you old Joe, we've got you now. They sense blood, they sense it at hand. The next day on June 25th in the morning, Joseph uh, wakes up and he pays, he posts the bail. Like, okay, I'm gonna post bail and leave and go back to Nauvoo. Sensing that they're, Joseph's going to slip out of their hands, uh, those, the, those who are against him immediately file another charge of treason and because uh, they know the treason will hold him. And one person says, if the treason charges don't succeed, they had 18 others ready. On June 26, Joseph meets with Governor Ford and tells him there's a plot afoot to kill him. He has heard it. Uh, he's heard the Higbees. Uh, he's heard uh, people talk about it. He knows what's going on. Governor Ford tells Joseph he's overly alarmed, that the people aren't that cruel. Governor Ford promises to protect Joseph. He tells him that he's going to go to Nauvoo and promises to take Joseph with him the next day. 
When Joseph wakes up on the morning on June 27th, Governor Ford decides to leave and not take Joseph Smith with him, uh, uh, taking his militia also, exposing Joseph to the protection of only the Carthage Greys who are uh, very anti in their feelings toward Joseph. He starts to sense um, uh, that his life is coming to a foot. Uh, one person says, we've had too much trouble to bring old Joe here to ever let him escape alive, and unless you want to die with him, you had better leave before sundown, and you'll see that I can prophesy better than old Joe. Joseph, sensing what is at hand, maybe not understanding it perfectly, but sensing that things are coming to a, a conclusion, writes a last letter to Emma in his own handwriting and writes, I am very much resigned to my lot, knowing I am justified and have done the best that could be done. Give my love to the children. May God bless you all. Amen. And then you know the rest of the story. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, a mob of 100 to 250 men, depending on the account, storm the Carthage jail, faces painted black. They immediately run up to the door. Joseph has been snuck in a, a pepper box pistol, and, and they open the door and shoot out in the hallway, trying to slow him down, but it's no hope uh, to defend themselves and to defend their friends. They are sitting ducks, four people sitting in a room surrounded by hundreds of people intent on killing them. I love this painting by Casey Childs showing John Taylor here, realizing the moment of death is at hand, and it happens so quickly in just a few minutes. Uh, you know, they break through the door, they shoot Hiram as he's leaning against the door in the face. Hiram falls on the floor and says, I'm a dead man. Willard Richards is pushed behind the door. John Taylor is shot multiple times in his hip and his leg, his hand, and rolls under the bed. Joseph makes a run for the window. Um, and uh, we don't know, it's hard to know what he's thinking in this moment, too. Uh, we, we don't know. And he's shot as he uh, attempts to jump from the window, lands on the ground, and is shot again, as this painting here shows, uh, by, the, by, the, by the well there, uh, and killed. There's a beautiful painting here by Gary Smith, the artist Gary Smith, showing when they come to recover and get the bodies of Joseph and Hiram. Well, as I uh, wrap this up and conclude these events that led up to this tragic, sad uh, martyrdom and death of Joseph and Hiram, section 135 has some very wonderful things in this eulogy to Joseph Smith. They were about ready to print the 1844 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and they were able to write this and get this into the printing of it in the 1844 edition. In verse 3, I, I just want to read some of these. In verse 3 is the classic line that Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. And it lists all of his accomplishments. It's interesting to ask yourself, uh, what has Joseph Smith done to help bring the fullness of the everlasting gospel onto this earth today and to extend it to all of those in the past so that everybody can make and keep covenants with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and find redemption through him? I love in verse 6, by the way, that sometimes we know that Joseph died for his testimony and the testimony of the Book of Mormon. Don't forget that he also died as a testimony of the doctrine and covenants. And verse 6 says, the reader in every nation will be reminded that the Book of Mormon and this book of doctrine and covenants cost the best blood of the 19th century to bring them forth for the salvation of a ruined world. It's interesting to ask yourself, what has the Book of Mormon and doctrine and covenants done to help give you the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And what witness do you have and what benefits from these wonderful books of Scripture? And I love in verse 7 as well that the writer of this concludes with, their innocent blood will be classed with the martyrs of religion under the altar that John saw. Um, and I want to just end with this question of what, what do we learn about sacrifice and giving of ourselves for the kingdom of God from Hiram and from Joseph Smith uh, that we can emulate in our smaller ways? Uh, most of us will never be asked uh, to give our life, literally, uh, for our faith, uh, although some sadly will, but 99% of us never will. But what we can do is we can give our natural man lives, the corrupt part of ourselves, for the faith and offer that up to the Lord. Well, I just want to conclude this by bearing my witness that Joseph Smith is the great revelator of this dispensation, that he laid the foundation of this restoration. I love Joseph Smith uh, for so many reasons. I consider him my brother. I consider him my friend. Uh, he is my prophet. Uh, and I'm so grateful uh, for him and his influence. 
I look at the, re the religion that has been revealed through Joseph Smith. The doctrines are so expansive. They are so ennobling. They are so enlightening. The principles help us be better. They help us to love God and to love our fellow men. The covenants bind us to each other uh, to do so. I find so much meaning in the Holy Temple and the ordinances there and in service within the church, uh, in the promises of the restoration. I love, by the way, that Richard Bushman one time says, a religion that works has to be taken very seriously. And to me, the religion that was revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith works. It works. For me, it works. It's made me into a better, probably the best version of myself, as small as that is, that could possibly be. Um, and it's helped me become a better man and to grow line upon line, precept by precept. I love the Book of Mormon. I know that book is true. I love the Doctrine and Covenants with my whole soul. I get to teach from it uh, almost on a daily basis. I often find myself just shaking my head in awe of what the Lord worked through this man named Joseph Smith, uh, who revealed this wonderful restoration in these latter days to help move forward for one day the Kingdom of God being placed on this earth as the restoration is ongoing. I'm thankful beyond words to express that Joseph did what he did in his short life and that he sealed his work with his blood. Uh, may you and I be faithful to this restoration that he gave his life for. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.